we end this year and the 13th season of The Candid Frame with a conversation that I recorded earlier this month in Tokyo, Japan with my friend George Nabechi. During the two weeks that I was there, I conducted a workshop along with George, and it was an amazing experience, and it never would have happened had I not started this podcast almost 14 years ago. There are so many great things that have happened in my life as a result of this show, not least of which is having the opportunity to meet hundreds of photographers, some of whom have been my photographic heroes, some of whom I now call friends. And while this conversation revolves around my personal experiences in Japan, it's also a reaffirmation of my choice to create a unique photographic life for myself. Someone recently said that they wish they had my job because of all the things they see that I'm doing. I think they'd change their mind if they knew how little I actually make from all this work. But for me, it's never been work. It's something that I simply love to do. I couldn't imagine a life without photography and conversations and all these new experiences. I'm so glad that you have come along with me on this journey. And I look forward to sharing so much more with you in the coming year. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to the Candid Frame. Good morning, George. Morning, Ibarian X. Thanks for breakfast and the coffee. Much <laughs> needed. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> It's been an amazing two weeks. I'm, I'm, as I've told you probably too many times, but I'll never get tired of saying it. I just really uh, appreciate the invitation to come out here. Uh, to teach a workshop alongside with you and, and to experience Japan for the very first time. I can't imagine having a more ideal circumstance under which to discover your city, your country, and to share it with some wonderful students. And、um, it's been a really interesting experience. And before I leave today, I just want to have a, sort of a chance to, to talk to you about both of our experiences doing this. And、uh, yeah. That's kind of what I, what I want to do. Well,、uh, thank you for the kind words. I'm glad to hear that、um, you had such an enjoyable and it seems also、um, emotional and transformative time、uh, while you were here. That's always part of my goal、um, in producing these workshops is to create the best environment in which、uh, photographers, whom we all look up to and admire and respect, like you, Can be free to operate and to not just make meaningful photographs, but to, to get into a place where you can have a deep understanding of the culture and the country here. And I think that we do our best to always create experiences, not just for the instructors, but it begins with the instructors. When the instructors are comfortable、um, enjoying themselves and experiencing new things, it permeates through the class. And I think that was the case again this time with you and your enthusiasm, your you know, professionalism in the critiques and in instruction that allowed the students to also really experience and grow. So I knew that you'd be a great fit for what we try to do here. And I'm happy to say that I wasn't wrong.、Um, and <laughs> I'm glad so too. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a wonderful experience. And、um, hopefully, as well, that you and the students、uh, will take back memories from this trip and this experience with you and carry that forward in your own daily lives and, and such when you're yeah, home. Yeah, I mean, I really, I, I really、uh, feel that to a great degree. And last night, when we were, when we were talking to Sam Abel over the phone, I, I made the point that it felt like over the, I think, the past year, there have been these developments in my life, both personal and creatively. And it seems like it all converged、uh, in the last two weeks in Tokyo. And I'd had a, a sense that something was changing for me. And even though I haven't really fully processed the experience here, I feel like they all met together here. And part of it was. In terms of me feeling like I was moving towards something in terms of how I was seeing and photographing. But also, and also, it was also a place of really gratitude. Even before I came here, with all the circumstances in, in, in my life that I've kind of shared on occasion on, on the show and elsewhere, I felt like I was really ready to be present and in, in the moments. 
So there were a variety of different times here uh, when I didn't immediately pick up the camera. Like when we were in that garden. What was the name of the garden? Yeah, so we were at Rikugien Garden. Yeah, and when all the students went out to photograph, we just sat down and had tea and a biscuit. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, is what I wanted in that moment, even though dusk was happening and twilight and the the trees were being illuminated by lights and it was really m visually magical. I just wanted to sit there and mm -hmm. take it all in. And there have been moments throughout this trip where I would just do that, where I wasn't chasing the squirrel, as we put it, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to get a, a photograph that, that I thought I might lose. I was more than willing to miss uh, the occasional photograph mm -hmm. just to be, just to like take in a breath of fresh air after rain here and and just take it all in because I think there have been too many times in my life, not only when I've been traveling, but even at home, where I'm so caught up in life that I I, I miss it. It just whiz, it whizzes past me. I think that it's, it's what I needed, but also what I was kind of the place I was meant to be, and I don't mean physically by location, but sort of in sort of a mindset. So I think that's that's the the big takeaway f for me. I know I have I've created some wonderful photographs, but that seems like more like cream than the bulk of the experience here. Mm -hmm. I think your comments reminded me of a couple of things that our our participants, our students said. One, which was that. It felt like it went by in, almost instantly. Mm -hmm. And the second from a different student saying that for the first time in her life, she had really started to learn to slow down. And I think that's that's the goal with a workshop of this length. Initially, people might say, eight days, eight that's days, really yeah. long. What are you going to do? But when you have a two-day or three-day workshop, you are chasing things because there is a certain pressure to do as much photography as possible during that time. Mm -hmm. And when you stretch out to a longer time period, a week or more, you have the time to slow down and contemplate and reflect on what you're doing, uh, both through the critiques that we have in the room, but also on your own time of just reflection, your feelings towards being in a place often that's very foreign to you. You're slow, uh, slowly peeling back the layers of the onion, like I, mm -hmm. I like to say, to, to get to what's underneath and, and the core of that. So by design, it's meant to be that even in a seemingly incredibly busy and chaotic metropolis like Tokyo, yeah. that you can find your inner quiet. And that will help you lead to stronger uh, photographs both here and also when you go home. But also just the mentality of uh, taking a moment and slowing down. I think that that's a, a crucial element of the workshops and, and, and the reason why we do it for that long. Yeah, because it seems, it seems antithetical to be able to slow down in a city like Tokyo that is just moving, moving, moving. And it's just, I mean, you're just surrounded by this wave of humanity that is constantly moving through the city. In in a, in a very different fashion than any other city I've I've been in. Speak. I mean, you're from here. You live here, and I was talking a lot about slowing down. But you know, you had a lot on your plate. You were coordinating so many things, not only for this workshop, but for the workshops that you're going to go forward. You know, your 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 wedding is coming up next year. You got a whole lot on your plate. So I can imagine that for you, especially as a photographer finding those moments to slow down can be probably very difficult. Well, um, yes and no. I mean, I've, I've learned that um, out of limitations come new forms that something Arno Minkinen taught me. And certainly, you know, when I, I, I during a workshop, I'm 100% focused on and I'm dedicated to making the experience of our participants and our instructors the best that it can be. So that does mean less photography for me. However, that doesn't mean that I don't have the ability myself to take a moment to sit and have a coffee or, a you know, a pure matcha green tea in the traditional way in a garden and taking that scene. And out of that calmness, I can usually find, you know, often that the, the best photographs are just right around the corner. And because yeah. I waited, I've, I've long since let go of the idea that I need to get every photograph because I know that there are moments happening every 
single second、mm-hmm. all around me, somewhere in the city, somewhere in the world, and I'm missing them.、Yeah. I'm missing 99.99999% of them. But all I need is one, you know, in a given day or a given workshop, even. If I have one transcendent photograph that might make my portfolio out of a week, then that's okay. And once upon a time, I did chase more photographs, but I've learned that it's okay. You know, there, there are many photographs out there waiting to be made, and you can let a lot of them go. Yeah. One of the, the, the fun things about this trip、uh, with you is it's not so much shooting with you, but making discoveries with you. <laughs> and we would be like walking anywhere up the stairs in, in the subway, and we would see this pattern of light, and both of us. <laughs> Within seconds of each other, we'd go, ooh. <laughs> you know, and, and, and being with someone who is as sensitive to what I'm sensitive, sensitive to visually was really a treat because usually I'm with a group and I'm pointing it out to someone else who doesn't see it. And, and sharing moments like that with someone where you don't have to even say anything. You just hear that noise come out of each other's <laughs> mouth and the eye, head turned in that direction. It's like, ooh. It was also nice to just make, make discoveries that I otherwise would not have made as a result of just being in your company. So that was one of the,、uh, the, the best p a r t of the experience for me here. Well, thank you. Yeah, it, likewise, it, it was, it's、um, certainly fun as a photographer to, to walk around with someone who sees the world as you do. And,、um, you know, that, that we. We're interested in、um, many similar subjects, but we approach them very differently. But it's, it's, it is fun to, to do that together. And usually, you know, we're off in the corner、uh, in some alleyway while、oh, yeah. everybody else is walking by looking at the iconic thing. And we're, <laughs> there's a barrier next to George off in the corner, and people wondering, what are they looking at? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, loved, I love the alleyways here. It's like we go to Shibuya with that, that famous crosswalk,、mm-hmm. and that held less interest for me than those small, narrow alleyways with those small bars that could seat only six or seven people. And, and for me, that held much more fascination than the thing that, that are most iconic. I was looking at an Instagram feed, which I guess is from the Japanese Tourism Board, and it's,、uh, it's your Japan, I guess, is the, the model they're using. And I was looking at those photographs, and as pretty and beautiful as they were, I was like, oh, I'm glad that that's not my Japan. Right. You know, because you, you provided me a, a much more intimate exploration of, the, of not only Tokyo, but the areas outside of Tokyo. That, that for me, was, was, was fascinating getting to see Japan or get a glimpse of Japan through your eyes. Because I know, as you said several times before,、uh, we're just the tip. Right. You know, there,、yeah. there's, there's so much to be examined. And I can see that in my photographs.、Mm-hmm. I can see that as nicely put together as many of the images are, there's a, still a distance there. And、uh, I look forward to coming back to be able to dive a little deeper and create a more intimate experience for, for, for myself personally, but also to find a way of being able to. Uh, create images that reflect that, which is, which is a challenge anytime you think you're visiting any sort of destination that's away from home. is How do you create not only a single image, but a series of images that really speak to one's own experience?、Mm-hmm. Well,、um, several good、uh, talking points in there. One, you mentioned how. You know, the, the smaller areas, the little alleys that are lesser known or less frequented held more interest to you than the big crossing. And the itinerary of the workshop was done that way by design as well, which was we started at the iconic location, but after that, we pretty much avoided all the major places that tourists go to.、Mm-hmm. Um, and we stuck to the Tokyo that I know and I've come to appreciate. Although I've done workshops here now for the last four years and we've been all over the country, I've held off f- for a reason on doing a Tokyo specific workshop until this time. And I felt like, as much as this is the city that I grew up in, it was difficult to put together a truly curated, balanced experience here that would result in new and different photographs、mm-hmm. than. 
the standard photographs that that you see of Tokyo. And so I I took great care this being my backyard in terms of putting together something that that would work in terms of uh making new images. Yeah. And so it was important that that you came away with that. And I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed those little things more because that was by design. We start off, you know, as someplace recognizable, uh, just to give you a, a, a breadcrumb to follow. Mm -hmm. And then you go down the rabbit holes, so to speak, of, of Tokyo and, and discover it for yourself. Yeah. And going through the subways and, and, and getting in the subway during rush hour, you know, not catching... Ubers, which don't really exist here, uh, to travel back and forth or a bus or anything like that, to be surrounded by the, the people for whom this is home was fascinating. But I got to say, I'm very proud of myself that I was in shape enough to walk all those steps. I think we hit at some point something over 20,000 steps twice. One of the most was Russell Brown, who is a machine. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> I enjoyed it, but it left me completely exhausted that particular day. But it was, uh, you know, being on foot and, and, and exploring a city, there's no better way to do it. Uh, as convenient as, you know, all these different means of transportation can be, you miss so much mm -hmm. uh, as a result of just like going from one destination and to another destination and sort of rushing to get to this point and that point. And that's something that I've always enjoyed about any place that I visit, but it's been especially the case, uh, especially the case here. Well, I could see it reflected in the group's photographs. Um, the trains were in every person's portfolio yeah. um, when we were finished at the end. And that is um, an essential part of life here in Japan. And again, that's by design in that part of the experience is not just getting from location to location. The, the journey in between is a foot you know, photographer's playground, mm -hmm. um, being on those station platforms and on those trains um, provide opportunities for looking in, looking out, line, shadow, color, gesture. So many things happen in the train stations and on the trains themselves that um, it's fertile ground and um, it, it, it makes those let's say those 20,000 steps feel like less because yeah. you're, you're so engaged the whole time visually and just with all of the senses, really. Well, hopefully not taste, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you, you, you're, you've spent time with Sam Abel, Arthur Myerson, Nevada Weir, a whole variety of different really accomplished photographers. And I'm really curious to hear how s seeing your city in the presence of, of really accomplished photographers, what, what, what has that provided you? Have there been any sort of surprises about, uh, in terms of how you've discovered a city that you're so familiar with through, through the, their presence and through the images that they've created while you were with them? Um, yes, I think that um, the, the biggest or most pleasant surprise for me uh, initially was that I could add value, a lot of value to them in terms of how... I could curate and help them find places, locations, people that would interest them photographically, as mm -hmm. accomplished as they are. So one that I could I could contribute in that way. And two, it's always interesting to see how they perceive a place that I'm very familiar with and what interests them. Because as it gets to be sort of uh, very familiar to me in terms of walking past something every day and all of that, and I have my own, you know, little happy discoveries that I have. It's it's fascinating to see um, some of these great photographers come to these same places and and be happy as well, mm -hmm. um, which gives me some affirmation that I'm not uh, going down the wrong path in what I'm trying to do and photograph in my own career. And also, it gives me inspiration to continue to to work hard in my own neighborhoods, in my own um, city, and to to make work here. Because sometimes it it can get, you know, you you do get into that place where you're running from accountants' offices to the film lab to so and so, and you're yeah. not, and I'm not slowing down. And I just when I think back to those moments, um, I have memories with each of them in, in a different part of Tokyo. Then I can think back to that time and go, oh, yeah, remember when I was trying to photograph that? I wonder if that's still there and mm. what does it look like now? And in a city like Tokyo, things are changing so quickly. Um, I often go, go to that, return to that spot and find it, something has changed dramatically. 
And uh, so I go and document that as well. But you were telling me that because of how busy you are sometimes, it's, you still haven't seen pictures that you shot months ago. Years ago. Years ago, cases, my God. Yes. Uh, I wait. I, I, I like waiting a couple of months before diving in, but I can't ima- imagine years later. Uh, that must be strange when all of a sudden you finally get to it and you realize, oh, that place is not there anymore. Oh, certainly, yes. But there's also, um, yeah, uh, interesting discoveries when sometimes I'm asked for a picture for some project or something, I go and pull it out, out, go through the archive and that just just that folder knowing that I was there. So I must have something and I mm-hmm. look and I think, oh, <laughs> I, there were some interesting photographs in here that I haven't looked at. <laughs> of course, there's a whole lot of like, things in there as well where I think what was I thinking spending yeah. so much time shooting that but I think that's true of most photographers um, but yeah it's it's certainly um, <laughs> I wish I had more time I wish I had a clone of myself one yeah. to uh, f- you know do the workshops and one to to actually just go through the editing the work that I've made but it is what it is and it's it's better to be busy and have a lot of things on your plate I think and engaged with everything that's happening in your photographic life than the other way around so I am grateful for you know um, how how uh, my life is even though yes I wish I had I think the one thing we all wish we had more of was is time yeah yeah There are thousands of people who download each episode of The Candid Frame weeks after its release. And over time, those numbers grow, with some episodes enjoying more than 20,000 downloads, even years after they were first released. It's very gratifying that the entire archive of interviews we have produced is seen as worthy of your attention and time. But of all those listeners, we only receive financial support from less than 3% of them. The support that they provide is invaluable, as it helps us to meet our month-to-month cost, upgrade equipment, and keep the lights on in the studio. But we could do so much more if we could increase that support to just 5% in the coming year. And you can help make that happen by contributing as little as $5 a month to our Patreon effort. That modest amount will help us to do even more with the show. So visit patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame and become a Patreon supporter today. Thanks. What was interesting about, because I usually work with just one camera, and for for a long time it's been in the X100F, and I got the X-T3 recently. And so at first I was carrying both cameras, and that quickly revealed itself as being too unwieldy. And it really had to just go back to just using one camera and oftentimes just going out with one lens. And I bought like, I think, four four lenses. But uh, when I would go out, I would just have two. The one on the camera and the other one I would switch it to. So it would be the 35 and the 50 or the 35 and the um, uh, 16. And that would be it because I... It, Having too many choices was really a hindrance. And I think initially when I came here, I felt like, well, I want to have all these things mm-hmm. just because uh, it's my first experience and I just want to make sure I have enough to be able to get what I need. And I realized very quickly that uh, that I work better very, very simply. Mm-hmm. And yes, I'll always travel with a backup camera, but um, really I'll just shoot with just one and you just have one you know, one primary lens and a second lens, and I'll just keep it like that. And the, the it just reinforces for me the whole process of just really keeping it simple because the more mm-hmm. more things I have to think about, the more choices I have, the less focused I am on being present and seeing. Right. Well, Arthur likes to say less is more all the time yeah. when it comes to equipment. And I think that certainly for what we are trying to do in Tokyo, there's no need to bring... Um, a whole lot of gear, um, heavy lenses and things like that, you know, and, and certainly I think that the more your camera is, is an extension of your body that, you know, so well that you're not switching back and forth between Mm -hmm. setups, the, the, the better you can produce in something like this. That is not to say that carrying two, two cameras, uh, is too much or that don't bring zoom lenses, only shoot primes or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But for me as well, um, I think that. 
It's funny you mentioned the X100. Um, I think <laughs> we both shot with an X100F and the X-T3. I think Fuji should be like paying us to say <laughs> this or whatever. <laughs> but um, one of the best things I did as well back in 2015 was when I finished my workshop with Sam Abel, I came back to Japan for the first time as a you know dedicated photographer. And I journeyed this country by train for about two months on my own. And during that time... I had taken heed from Sam's lessons in, in, in my workshop with him in Santa Fe. And I brought just the one lens from my Nikon, about a 28 millimeter prime. Um, and then I, as my backup camera, which ended up being a good idea because my Nikon body failed on me. So I had to send it to a repair shop for two weeks. Mm. As a backup camera, I bought the Fuji X100T. And um, so I walked around with the equivalent of a 35 millimeter and a 28 millimeter, and I learned to move my feet. Yeah. And even to this day, uh, even with, when I'm working with zoom lenses, my first instinct is to move my feet to get myself in a better position rather than rely on the zoom. Also to just instinctively be able to assess uh, what I want to capture in the frame. And before I even raise my camera, I know where I need to be to get everything in with a 35 or where I need to be with a 28. And I think that, um, so you, you touch on some good points there and that, yes, less is more, but also getting to know your equipment really well um, is is helpful. And um, yeah, I think that this this type of workshop allows you to do that as well because you have eight days, your, your camera is yeah. your best friend and you're working every day. And how often do you, Give yourself at home. I know I don't. Give yourself the, the gift of eight days of dedication to photography where you're making work every day and going through work every day. When we're at home, you know, all sorts of things creep in. Yeah. Uh, things you got to do. Take out the garbage, like walk the dog and all. And all the, those are wonderful things. I love dogs. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but eight days in a place where you're with other like-minded people and you're focused on photography and on the experience, that's a wonderful gift to give yourself, I think. Yeah, and I think the, the biggest challenge I think a lot of the students faced, that even with the luxury of all that time, they were still uh, what we came to describe as chasing the squirrel. And we got to talk about that because I think that uh, anybody who travels anywhere is very susceptible to to that. So how would you describe what chasing the squirrel is? Well, um, yeah, uh, chasing the squirrel or chasing the rabbit, if you like, uh, you know, dogs, uh, they, they have short attention spans and they see a squirrel in a tree and then they're, they're going to go chasing after it, even though it's probably hopeless that they'll catch the squirrel. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, chasing the rabbit, i.e. from Alice in Wonderland, the, the you know, oh, yeah. the white rabbit's going to come by, you're going to see and you're going to... you. you going to follow it down some rabbit hole but then you're going to be lost because it's it's going to disappear run away from you and um you know so both both expressions are apt um but i think that especially in a, a city where a lot's happening it's really easy to find something happening uh be it a woman in a beautiful red coat or it's um you know street sweepers who are cleaning up and um, there's the gesture or um the, you know the construction workers in in tokyo have these wonderful v-shaped vests that glow that that mm -hmm. flash uh red lights at night so um it's easy to to, to go chase chase them but Again, I think the important thing is, are you just trying to capture the subject in, and you don't care about where you capture the subject? Or can you maybe anticipate where you might see, uh, you know, sort of a better circumstances for a photograph mm -hmm. with that subject that drew your interest? And slowing yourself down or anticipating where that person might go, that would be in a better position for you to make a more compelling photograph. Yeah, because you know? one of the things that I... I did in this workshop and the other ones that I do is the, the important setting, you know, about really looking at the scene and not just the, the, the subject. But to, to get to that point, you have to, I think even before you start practicing that way of seeing, you have to surrender to the idea that you have to get every shot, that somehow you're, you're missing something valuable because you're not able to get the capture. And I think once you're able to do that, you can give yourself the luxury of really making the most out of the time rather than seeing it as this fleeting thing and rushing and mm -hmm. rushing it. And I think that a lot of the students got that towards the, the end. I, I think, thankfully, I sort of came with that, uh, I already came with that attitude coming in, but 
when taking a look at the sort of the initial images, uh, it was the city was still so so new to me that I wasn't as carefully framing as I started within probably three or four days. Uh, that that first restaurant you took me to with that chef. Mm-hmm. with the personality of a rock star. And uh, I look at those pictures, and it just didn't do do it credit. It documented where I was, but I was just like so caught up in just being in Tokyo and, and this guy and this amazing meal that um, I look forward to coming back and really creating an image that's reflective of my experience. And the idea of, 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 of chasing the, the squirrel or chasing the rabbit is completely antithetical to to being able to do that because we've all seen uh, photographers who've gone out to some location and they give us a slideshow and it's just snapshot after snapshot after snapshot. And they, they talk about how wonderful of experience they had, but you really don't see it in the imagery. You see where they were, but they don't, you don't get a sense of what it felt like to be there. And uh, I don't know if my images succeed in, in doing that. I know they don't succeed in the way that I, I eventually hope to be, mm-hmm. to get, mm-hmm. but I I know it's there. And for me, it, whether I'm visiting Japan or whether I'm going anywhere, I'm always going to be looking for a means to be able to create images that are a mirror of who I was in that particular moment. Right. Which well, is hard. It is. It is hard. And, um, you know, uh, as you say, whether it's Japan or you go elsewhere, also, even at home, um, I think it's important to stop and take a moment to look at a place, really look at it and assess what is it about that place that, that, that's drawing me, you know, sensibility wise. And um, is it the light? Is it the framing? Is it the, 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 the chef behind the counter? Mm-hmm. What is it about that place that, that is appealing to me, both as a photographer and as a person. And uh, so it's really easy to walk into a a store or a a festival stall or something like that and see something, you know, very colorful and vibrant and interesting. And then, you know, you come in, you know, camera half cocked, ready to mm -hmm. go and you start firing away. And I I like the idea. And I think you are very good at this is of making uh, yourself, uh, your presence, a part of the space it's both there and it isn't in that you establish yourself as part of almost like the furniture, Mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you find a spot, you settle in and you wait and you have the patience and you also make yourself a part of what's happening in that environment. So let's say you go into a bar and it looks beautiful, order a drink, you know, receive your drink, interact with a barman, sit down, Maybe ask if it's necessary, ask permission to photograph in there. Nine times out of 10, you're, you're a customer, mm-hmm. he's happy to oblige, right? And, and then a few minutes pass and he's forgotten all about you and he's gone back to doing what he's doing. You're slowly nursing your drink while you're making photographs. And that kind of approach versus chasing the rabbit tends to work, I think, almost anywhere. So. Yeah. Yeah, one of my uh, favorite favorite <clears throat> sets of images is the, the that older woman yesterday mm-hmm. at the department store when we were buying Cynthia. What was it called? A yukata. A yukata. Yeah, which is like a kimono, of uh, similar mm-hmm. um, uh, garment. Yeah, those images of of that focused on a person, I think, are probably going to be one of my most favorite images from the trip because of the experience I had with her while I was buying that yukata. I mean, she was so sweet, but she was also very slow, <laughs> very methodical, which probably would have driven some Americans crazy. But it just endeared me to her because I could see that even though she had mobility issues, she was so dedicated in in helping me to be able to pick a garment for, for, for Cynthia that I, 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 I just felt like the images were precious. My moment with her was precious, even though it was just an, a, a business exchange. For me, it was a very personal one because of the moments I I shared with her. Uh, even though I didn't speak the language, you were serving as a translator, and I felt like I had a really genuine moment for, with her. And for me, the, the the photographs of people become all the richer when I've had those moments where I can point to a photograph and go, 
oh, this is who this person was. This is how I related to her for those 20 or 30 minutes that we spent together. That for me is much more than, oh, look how nicely this is composed. Look at the expression. Look at the gesture. You know, if the, if the photograph is exceptional, uh, just as a photograph, that's great. But it's all the more important if I have an experience that I can, I can attach to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that, as you allude to, it creates an environment where you have a feeling, an emotion that is that you are trying to convey. Mm-hmm. Right? You've had the sweetness of this lady attending to to this garment and helping you and demonstrating how the 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 belt should be put on and things like that, which you captured yeah. on vi- in a beautiful, sweet video, and and things like that. So once that interaction happens, then. It, it changes your mentality about what it is that you're trying to capture and you're trying to convey the sweetness of this lady and, and photographing her in that way. And I think that the heart in the photography comes through when you do that, as you say, versus just waiting for the perfect person to come into the right Right. spot in Mm -hmm. the light and bang, which is fine. It's a well composed, well executed photograph, but maybe it doesn't convey that emotion, that feeling in a way that we're all trying to strive towards as photographers to, to say something about the world that, that is new and or old that we can relate to. Yeah, like uh, last night we were having the most amazing meal of sushi I've ever, ever had. I still feel it in my belly right now as we, as we speak. It was the sort of the personality and the love that your sushi chef had as he prepared our various things to to eat uh the young the older couple that was to our right an older uh, couple and she had come in a wheelchair and how gently her husband helped her into the seat and how they shared a meal together as delicious as the food was it was the presence of those people that i was sharing it with even though i wasn't actively talking throughout the entire thing it it made the whole thing delicious and I think that's often missing from most Westerners' travels to anywhere, mm-hmm. right? It's just, let's just check off that we were here, we were there. You know, the whole selfie culture where people are just like documenting, they're not really looking. It's like I saw that at, uh, when I went to Paris the first time and saw the Mona Lisa. No one was looking at the painting. Everyone was making either a picture of the painting or a selfie of, of with the painting in the background. And it's like, wow, you spend all that money, all that time, all that effort to get to there, and you're never really there. Mm-hmm. So, which is a, a shame, but I'm glad that, you know, in this trip, it sort of set the bar for how I will experience any place away from home from now on, because I realize how much, how valuable, how much more valuable the time is, and how important it is to get into a mindset where I can truly appreciate it, both personally, but also and also as a as a photographer. Mm. Well, yeah, I uh, speak to a lot of good good points there, but I think that well, the beauty of photography is that we are in tune with the world, right? I mean, we are learning all the time, more and more to to see. And to stop and see things that other people may overlook. And so the very nature of what we do should be conducive to slowing down mm-hmm. um, if, we, if we allow ourselves to. Yeah. You know, I, when I was younger, I, I traveled a lot. And often I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off too. Um, I think the first solo around the world trip I did, I did six continents, 14 countries in 58 days or something like that, mm-hmm. which is goes to show that I was running around trying to cover as much as I could. Later travels, I would spend like a month in in the deep rural areas of Brazil or things like that. I learned to slow myself down. But it was only after I got that out of my system. Um, There were no smartphones or anything like that back Mm -hmm. then, of course. Um, And I, 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 like you, I I don't really take selfies. So I'm the Mm -hmm. worst at it. I don't even know where to look on the thing. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I just, and I don't like the way I look uh, on, on, on a camera like that uh, with a front camera. So I just, I just don't bother, but yeah, it's never occurred to me to do that. However, um, slowing down has, you know, um, 
Uh, the more you travel, the more I think you learn that, okay, yeah, I, I want to slow down. I'm going to take my time in a place, get to know it. And then if there's something that's interesting, then, then I can get to photographing. Yeah. yeah. One of the most gratifying things about the teaching, about the teaching experience this time, because this is the longest time that I have taught. I've done three-day workshops, but this is the first time that I've done eight. And they've always incorporated the editing process, you know, culling, culling images down, making the selections. And what I really enjoyed about this, because I was spending so much time photographing alongside the, you know, um, David, John, Sacco, and Stephen, was that I was witnessing how they were approaching things, how they were making photographs. But it wasn't until we sat down and we started editing it down to a, a first eight images and a, eventually 15. And as we were sitting there, you know, doing going through the process, making the discovery of how they had experienced Tokyo and how distinctive each voice was. Stephen had made the, the point that when people look at his photographs, they, they, they say they don't know what his style is because he seems to photograph everything. But by the time we got down to the final edit for the slideshow, everyone had a distinct style. Sako in particular was uh, amazing because I think she surprised everyone, including herself, by the kinds of images that ended up making the cut. And I think that uh, she's a, a really good example of what a photographer thinks they are. And then when you get down to the edit, you get a, a truer sense of who they are. Th that for me was one of the sort of the best e experiences of there because there's such a contrast between the personality we were engaging with day to day and the edit that we saw. It was like, oh, you didn't feel like, oh yeah, that's who that person is. And I don't think I experienced that with any of the photographers, but particularly with her, it was like, Wow, I got a, I got a glimpse into a part of you that is is not as easily perceived, but that's nevertheless there. And I'm I'm very humbled that I was able to sort of facilitate that for her. And uh, and I think as she wrote in the email to us later, she was very appreciative of it. So, right um, as as teachers, and that's that's the ultimate goal, right? Is to connect with our with our students um, for them to have a transformative experience as well and for them to come out of this knowing themselves better than they did mm -hmm. and I think that on all those counts all four of our participants this time I think we <laughs> I think they, we all had breakthroughs um, yeah. in that way so we're going to do this again next year right we are Okay, so we're, we're talking about December? We're doing December again, and people have asked in the past, why December? Uh, but as you've discovered um, on this trip at Barionex, that actually December is great in that you come after Thanksgiving, it's before you know Hanukkah or Christmas and, and, and New Year's and all of that, and there's that nice window of time. And fall color is pretty late in Tokyo. So one of the things that we get in the first week or so of December is some brilliant fall color, as we saw in that garden when we had tea. Um, the other aspect that I really, really like more than anything is the light. Oh, so, yeah, it was so gorgeous. Right. With the sun staying low in the sky, you almost have golden hour throughout the day. I think on the very first day that you and I were walking around, uh, we looked at our watches. It was 1150 in the morning and it looked like golden hour mm. where we were. And so you, we have that. And the, the weather's pretty pleasant. Yeah, it's on the crisp side in the morning, certainly. But um, that you know, uh, there's there's not a ton of rain this time of year, and and it's it's very good in terms of the season of photograph. Um, and like I said, there's a little lull between Thanksgiving and and the end of year holidays, which which uh, I think this fills in nicely. So December, I think, is is a good time to do this in terms of what what we'd like to accomplish. Yeah, and I think one of the points we we kind of discovered is that we're going to keep it small because there's something about the intimacy that this. This could not work with 12 or 15 people right. getting shuttled in a bus. So I think we've agreed on six. That's right, yeah. So if people you know, are interested and they want to kind of, I know it's not on the site yet, but if they want to sort of 
right. find out more and block off the first two weeks of December okay. and we'll, we'll, um, you know, settle in on another sort of eight day window, um, yet again for, uh, 2020 and, um, yeah, we're going to cap it at six. Um, so everyone could get very, very, um, you know, hands-on personal instruction like we were able to give this time mm -hmm. and that we can continue to experience things together, you know, using yeah. things like taking the trains and, and things like that versus moving around in buses and distancing ourselves from the people. And you got some other workshops as well coming up with I Keith do. Carters and Abel. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a busy list. You know, I've got Arthur Meyerson uh, doing winter beginning next month. We've got uh, two weeks in the snow country of Japan. So look out for the images from that. I mean, uh, you know, we've been very lucky that that's full. Uh, we've got Keith Carter, which is now full, where we're doing mysticism and art photography in the southwest of Japan, in the forest and in the sea. And then we've got Sam Abel and the Cherry Blossom Trail, where we're going north and photographing the daily lives of people under the cherry blossoms, which was my uh, one of my breakthrough projects in Japan, was photographing that and was published in the biggest photo magazine here and things like that. So um, we're combining forces. To my knowledge of that area and then and then Sam's maestro, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like teaching. So we have that, um, and then um, we're doing something a little bit different with uh, Michael Clark, where we're doing motion, and so we're doing martial artists and performers and things like that traditional Japanese arts um, and capturing that with motion and lights and, and all of that. So creating something totally different. And then the, Japan's really busy because we've got the Olympics. So we'll take oh a bit of God, a break yeah. and then back, back on, on in the fall. And then, um, yeah, probably the top sort of workshop that we're looking forward to for that, for that time will be us. us uh, yeah. You coming back in December. Um, I really look forward to it. Um, you know, it's the only Tokyo workshop currently on the calendar and, um, I think it's it's exciting that way, and uh, I'm I think for considering uh, finally put the took the cover off of the Tokyo thing. Yeah. Um, it was a home run this time, and I just know that it will only get better as we go forward. Absolutely. So my last question that I ask each guest <laughs> is: I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that be, and why? Oh gosh, you put me on the spot here. I wasn't expecting this <laughs> one on this conversation. No, I know, but I've, I, um, I've, you know, I've given so many answers, and I'm trying to think. Um, but uh, you know, I think I, I, at this point, I would be remiss. Um, he's he's done a lot for me in in my career as well. But um, Jamie Stillings. He is a photographer who's um, primarily known for his uh, aerial work, but he's doing it on uh, renewable energy projects. And these are um, the prints he makes are just absolutely gorgeous. But um, he goes up in a helicopter, still the old fashioned way. And he's photographed, um, you know, Ivanpah Solar. Um, we did a project in Japan together where we photographed all these floating solar uh, panels in, in these rice ponds. Okay. Uh, very, very cool. And um, also he's done the Atacama Desert in Chile and so on. But really, really important work that speaks to the environment and, and the direction of renewable energy, but done in such a beautiful way. So I'd say Jamie Stillings, you know, uh, his work is really, really interesting. Great. Well, George, thanks so much for everything. Well, thank you, Barry Nex. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you here in Japan. Um, and I look forward to uh, seeing you here again next year. Well, hopefully I'll see you before that back in the U.S. But... <laughs> Thanks to George for his friendship and his hospitality. To find out more about the workshops he conducts in Japan with the likes of Sam Abel, Nevada Weir, Arthur Meyerson, Greg Gorman, and others, visit nobechicreative.com. You can also support the show by writing a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And even better, if you really enjoy an episode, spread the word via an email to a friend, a post on your social networks, or word of mouth. It makes all the difference. So thank you for your support and being part of the TCF. And check out our YouTube channel where I offer comments on photography submitted by TCF listeners who contribute to the Candid Frame Flickr poll. Check out the TCF Flickr poll and our YouTube channel by clicking on the link in the show notes and the website. 
My latest book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, is now available. You can purchase it today and receive 40% off the list price when you order it from the Rocky Nook website. Use the promo code Pirello40 at checkout to take advantage of the discount. And receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks by signing up for the Candid Frame mailing list, where I share thoughts about life, photography, and keep you updated on TCF events. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or donating through PayPal. Thanks to Hubert Thompson, Chandra Achberger, Boris Henkemeyer, and Sanjay Vijayanathan for their recent contributions. Not all episodes may be available on your podcast app of choice. So to download, listen, and share any and all episodes of The Candid Frame, download the TCF app for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your support, it's free. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibadian X, and this is The Candid Frame. Happy New Year. <laughs>